Good afternoon, everybody. Hello. Happy Monday. Um, I don't have anything off the top, uh, so I see our friend is tardy. So, Sean, go ahead. Uh, sure. I guess a few places to start, but uh, Russia. Uh, Vladimir Putin has uh, won, according to Russian officials, a very resounding victory. Does the U.S. have any comment on either on the the margin of victory or, or more generally on, on the election conduct? You know, Sean, I was on the edge of my seat. It was such a nail biter. Um, uh, no, look, in in all seriousness. Uh, it, to be very clear, the Russian people deserve a free and fair election and the ability to choose among uh, a group of candidates representing a, a diverse set of views. Russians, like everyone else, deserve access to impartial information to help them choose the leadership that they so desire and help them determine the future of their country. And that was clearly not the case in these elections, which were neither free uh, nor fair. And as you all know, the Kremlin has imprisoned political opponents and prevented others from running. They've denied anti-war candidates, um, among other things. Um, and as you also all know, um, that leading Kremlin critic Alexei Navalny recently died in custody following years of harassment, abuse, and imprisonment. Um, so uh, this election occurred in an environment uh, of intense repression and imprisonment. Um, and uh, ultimately, Though Vladimir Putin is likely to remain uh, the president of, of Russia, though recognizing that is certainly not any excuse uh, for his autocracy. Just the last person, recognizing that is not an excuse. Like recognizing he's just just to, on, on the recognizing that he it is likely that he is going to remain uh, president of, of the Russian Federation. Sure, I mean some in the dissident community have been saying that the United States should hold off of formally recognizing the victory in whatever shape that means. I mean, does, does the United States recognize that, that he is reelected? Uh, obviously, obviously, he is president of Russia, but is, is the United States recognizing the, the results? Well, Sean, it certainly uh, was an undemocratic process, and I think it is safe to say that uh, there certainly won't be any uh, congratulatory calls uh, coming from uh, the United States of America. But uh, like I said, he is uh, likely to remain uh, the president of Russia, um, but that does not excuse uh, him of uh, his autocracy. Sorry, what does it mean likely to remain the president of Russia? He, he will remain the president of Russia. <laughs> well, why do you keep saying likely? That. You've said it like four times now. He, he, he's going to remain the president of Russia. But again, I think right. the bigger point here, uh, Matt, is that, as I said, this was an incredibly undemocratic process. Uh, and certainly him being president of Russia does not uh, excuse him of his, of his autocracy. Right. I, I'm do you sorry, want to I... coming back to you? Well, I was late, so I don't know. Have you done other subjects? or did No, you just, just, just walked in. All right. I have other subjects, but uh, since I was late, I'll let others go well, first. In the spirit of politeness and democracy. Any, first, hey. Anything else? Hey. Well, okay, before we, uh, before we pivot away to a different topic, I will go back to the Associated Press in case. Oh, since, yeah. Unless anybody else has elections on Russia, which is the last thing we were talking about. Okay, so... Go ahead. Well, I have questions on Haiti, but I also have questions on Niger. So um, let's just start with Haiti. What's the what's the latest situation with the evacuation flights? So um, uh, some of you uh, uh, we were in touch with about this over this weekend, but on Sunday, March 17th, the department facilitated uh, the safe departure of over 30 uh, American citizens on a U.S. government charter flight from Cap Haitian, Haiti, to Miami International Airport. Um, as you all know, that uh, the Haiti has been at a level four do not travel um, state since March of 2020. Uh, U.S. citizens should not travel to Haiti, and those in Haiti should depart immediately using commercial or other private transportation options when available and uh, safe to do so. Well, okay, but are there more flight planned? This is, uh, the, we're, we're, we're taking this process step by uh, step, Matt. This is a fluid and quickly evolving situation on the ground. We are continually to staying in touch with American citizens and those who mm -hmm. may either be interested in hearing from embassy operations or interested in potential uh, assistance in departing, uh, and we'll be in touch with them should additional measures uh, materialize. But I don't have anything, any updates to offer All at right. this and moment right now. And then on the now. political situation and the agreement that the secretary uh, helped broker last week, beginning of last week. 
So it is, um, it, it is not hyperbole to say that this is one of the most dire humanitarian situations in the world. Um, gang violence continues to make the security situation in Haiti untenable, and uh, it is a, a region that demands our attention and action. Um, I understand that Haitian stakeholders are very close to finalizing membership and remain in active discussions with CARICOM leaders as it make as it as it relates to the makeup of the transitional presidential council. Um, I expect them to have an update hopefully uh, as soon as today and, and would refer you to them in CARICOM. But uh, the announcement of this council, uh, we believe, will help pave the way for free and fair elections and the deployment of the multi uh, national security support mission. Uh, and the TPC's goal is to work for and improve the lives of all Haitians. And uh, we're seeing um, gang members do the exact opposite. Thanks. Uh, God. Um, I'm trying to understand the sequencing here. On Thursday, Matt stood where you are and said there were no plans now or in the future to evacuate Americans. And then it was less than 48 hours. We then heard there was a charter flight that took Americans out. So wondering what transpired and what changed in those hours. Let me, let me, so first let me, let's take a little bit of a, of a step back. First, I would say that uh, when it comes to the safety and security of American citizens, especially those abroad, uh, especially those in uh, dangerous, untenable security situations, that is, uh, we have no higher priority when it comes to that. I will also say in, in question to Matt's, in response to Matt's question about uh, will there be potentially other uh, movements um, like this for American citizens, that it, it is a very fluid and dynamic situation on the ground and circumstances uh, change uh, quite rapidly. Um, and the commercial uh, options that are available um, are either non-existent or quite, quite limited. Uh, and so a decision was made uh, to uh, conduct this kind of, uh, pull this kind of plan together. Uh, but I, I will also add that you know, we are the United States of America. This is what we do. Um, and in countries around the world where we have diplomats, where we have American citizens, we have um, contingency planning, feasibility planning, um, always in the works uh, to rely on should the circumstances on the ground warrant it. So, so are you saying that the situation, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but just understand the situation on the ground. The assessment made was made, an assessment was made by us that uh, the situation on the ground, both when it came to the security circumstances on the ground, as well as the uh, feasibility of commercial options, made it such that we thought it was in the interest of the American citizens who could make their way to Cap Haitian, um, that such, a, uh, such an um, avenue be for departure be made available to them. And then quick follow up. Um, 30 some American citizen seems like a very small number, considering Matt also told us on Thursday that there were several hundred who had reached out to state through the portal to register interest in trying to get out, or not interest, but asking for more information, indicating they would like to get out. Um, are you, how concerned are you about the safety of those hundreds of Americans that are still there? This is a, a fluid uh, situation. And um, the, the number of individuals who have reached out to us through the crisis intake form um, is approaching 1,000. And we're continuing to monitor the situation closely and evaluate the demand of US citizens, uh, evaluate the overall security situation, evaluate uh, what is feasible when it comes to commercial transportation mm -hmm. options, what is feasible for other um, uh, transportation solutions. So uh, I, I am just going to say that that work is ongoing, uh, and we have no higher priority than the safety and security of American citizens, though we certainly recognize the security situation is uh, untenable and we're continuing to uh, look at what might be possible. Come on. Thank you. Um, are you able to, to clarify if the American citizens who got out over the weekend, are they all American citizens? Are there any lawful permanent residents? Is it non-American family? Uh, can you just clarify those? So uh, I don't have a um, I don't have a makeup to offer of uh, the passengers on Sunday's uh, flight beyond what I said, which is that the departure of uh, over 30 U.S. citizens. Uh, our priority right now continues to be American citizens. Uh, we will take a look at uh, individuals of other categories based on um, availability, resources, uh, demand signals, and things like that. But right now, our priority continues to be American citizens. And, and can you say if most of the Americans who have 
signed up to the crisis intake form, you're saying that this is approaching a thousand. Uh, are they mostly in Port-au-Prince? Are they? Can you give an idea on location? I, I, I'm not in a place to to offer offer um, that kind of breakdown. Uh, I think an important thing to remember, Camilla, is that when people. Um, register with our crisis intake form. It is uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, many, we assume, are uh, in a circumstance where they are ready to uh, fully depart the country, per se. Others may be more interested in just getting status updates, getting information on what avenues might be available to them. It is hard to uh, paint this entire population uh, with, a, with a single stroke. And, and can you just, one more, can you just mm. clarify on, um, there's been reports about Guantanamo Bay and its, its possible usage in, in this uh, crisis in Haiti. Um, are there any state uh, offices, departmental offices based in Gitmo at the moment? Uh, not to my knowledge. Um, and I think uh, the Department of Homeland Security uh, may be happy to speak to you about any uh, contingency planning that they uh, are doing as it relates to uh, potential migration activities. I will just note that uh, from our uh, perch and vantage point, uh, irregular migration levels in the Caribbean continue to be low. But uh, in terms of any planning that is underway, um, I'm sure my colleagues at DHS would be happy to, to speak to you. Staying with the front, Simon, anything? Uh, if we're staying on Haiti, then go, you can go elsewhere. Right? Okay. Anything else on Haiti before we... Um, well, we can switch. Uh, Nick, you look like you were about to put your hand up. Haiti? No? You're good? All right. Um, can we, can we on go, Haiti? No. Okay, then I'm going to go to Simon. Gaza, I'll, I'll come to you side. I uh, yeah, but. I wondered if on Gaza um, we could get your response to the, uh, the IPC, the Integrated Food Security Phase Classification Assessment. Um, basically saying uh, it's already f the situation, food shortages in the Gaza Strip have already exceeded famine levels, mass, de mass death is now imminent, um, and basically the UN says a ceasefire immediately is needed to, to avert this. Um, you know, is that something that, given the, the severity that's, that's laid out in this report, um, that, you, that the US might consider? So first, I, I just want to say we have seen this alarming and heart-wrenching report, and um, it, is, it is quite stark. There are children um, who are starving, uh, th that are uh, malnourished as a result of the fact that humanitarian assistance can't get to them. Uh, and that is why we believe so strongly that everything must be done to scale up the delivery of humanitarian assistance. Um, we believe uh, sustained humanitarian assistance is required. Um, unhindered land convoys, uh, we think, are uh, irreplaceable when it comes to the ability to reach people uh, wherever they are across Gaza, uh, in addition to the additive and supplemental efforts of uh, delivery of food via maritime routes and airdrops. Um, I don't have any uh, new policy to announce, Simon. You've heard the secretary say uh, pretty clearly that we are for um, a, a ceasefire, but one that is uh, coupled with the uh, release of, of the hostages and one that allows um, some uh, space for continued d d diplomacy and deliberations uh, for broader peace and security uh, in the region. Um, you, you mentioned unhindered land convoys. So that, is it correct that Israel is hindering the, the flow of, of, of aid across the, the land border? That, that's not at all uh, what I was um, saying, uh, meaning to imply. The point that I'm making is that there ha the, the, the amount of aid um, that has been uh, entering Gaza uh, up to point, we continue to need more. And this and report is, uh, it is pretty stark in its assessment of how much more is needed. But we continue to see progress in that space. I will say over the weekend, um, over the weekend, the World Food Program's 96th Gate Convoy successfully delivered aid into Gaza. 18 trucks were able to enter the north without any incident, were able to offload at their planned <coughs> destinations without any looting. Um, there was no additional inter in uh, interference. I will also say that since March 2nd, um, U.S. C-130s and U.S. c 17s have dropped more than uh, 315,000 meals, more than 140,000 bottles of water, and more than five tons of items such as rice, flour, 
uh, pasta and canned foods. I'm certainly not trying to make the case that any of this um, is enough or uh, addressing uh, enough to uh, alleviate any concerns, but it is um, a step in the right direction and it's the kind of metrics uh, we want to see and continue to hopefully see um, in, the, in the days ahead. But just to clarify, the 18 trucks, surely there were, you know, there could be more trucks if it wasn't for the Israelis who are controlling that, that border. Again, this is not a, a, you've heard me say this before, this is not a border that the, the, the United States controls and uh, Israel has uh, legitimate uh, security concerns um, and uh, we're respectful of appropriate t steps that need to be taken um, for assessing security for anything that might be uh, entering Gaza. But we also continue to believe that uh, more can be done expeditiously, more can be done rapidly, uh, and overall more steps can be taken to allow uh, the entrance of aid to help alleviate the the dire humanitarian crisis in Gaza so that sorry I'll, I'll hand over in a second but the, this this 96 gate there was this one load of trucks that went through is that now like a regular crossing that trucks will be going through that's like our every hope day? that's our hope that's not for um, that's not for uh, me to speak to from up here I sort of just offer this metric to you as an assessment but our hope is that um, the avenues that exist for uh, humanitarian aid to flow into Gaza all of them um, uh, these gates uh, airdrops and so heavy that all of them be pursued uh, aggressively so as to help alleviate the 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 humanitarian crisis in, in Gaza right now. Sorry, yeah. you mentioned that one of the things that you were dropping was pasta. Are those part of MREs or or are you dropping when you drop the pasta, are you dropping enough clean water so it can be cooked? I don't have a I don't have a, a technical breakdown of the of the of the kits, Matt. I just have uh, five tons of food items that include rice, flour, pasta and canned food. But I'm happy to I'm I'm sure USAID would be happy to to, okay. to check with you. Thank you. It's likely that they may already be ready to eat meals and already cooked, so have you. Uh, thank you, Vidant. A uh, couple of questions. Uh, today, the Israelis uh, assassinated Faik uh, Mabhur, who is one of the police commanders, and in fact, he was responsible for the distribution of the American flour a couple of weeks ago, and so on, and effectively and efficiently. Now, uh, if I, if I recall, there was, uh, back in February, I think February 24th, uh, the administration <coughs> requested that Israel not assassinate the police force because they, they keep order and so on. The, is it, has Israel broken this? this I'm not aware of this you know, uh, specific could, report. Could you, I, could you look I, into I, it? I, I'm not aware of this specific report, but I'm happy okay. to... to right. I have a couple more questions yeah. uh, just you know, to follow up on, on Simon's. Uh, UNICEF says that 13,000 children in Gaza have been killed. It is really, it's a staggering. But it doesn't seem to have any end. I mean, this thing keeps going day after day. The Israelis keep going to the hospitals, you know, over and over and over again. Uh, you know, so we see them now at the Shifa complex. So what is, what is your comment? I mean, could, could this go on for the next six months? Let me, let me say a couple things on this side. First, uh, as it relates to uh, any timeline, um, we have not been, uh, we have not parsed words about the fact that we wanted to see this conflict uh, end as soon as possible. And in fact, uh, Hamas could end this conflict yesterday. Hamas could lay down its arms, all of its arms. Hamas could stop co-locating itself with civilian infrastructure, with civilian institutions like hospitals. Uh, Hamas could release all of the hostages that it has been holding since October 7th. All of those things could happen. Um, and on the impact on children, we are, of course, devastated by the toll that this conflict has taken. It is an unspeakable tragedy, uh, the number of children that have been killed. And it is an unacceptable outcome of uh, the fighting of the past five months. Uh, and that is why at every uh, opportunity, uh, we have reiterated uh, to our Israeli partners that uh, additional steps uh, must be taken to minimize uh, civilian casualties. But again, Saeed, I will also remind you that Hamas could end this conflict at any moment okay. uh, by releasing all of its hostages, by um, laying down its arms. So uh, nothing short of Hamas laying down its arms will bring this war to an end, right? That's, that that's not at all, that's not what I'm but, saying. But that's Saeed. what you just said. That's, that's not what I'm saying. When it comes to 
uh, when it when it comes to a ceasefire, we have been very clear. I have, Matt has, the secretary has that we believe that uh, progress being made on the release of hostages uh, could allow for the conditions in which uh, broader diplomatic conversations can be had when it comes to the safety, security, and stability of the region. And um, conditions could be created in which additional humanitarian aid uh, might be uh, uh, able to enter Gaza, which is what we would hope for in such a ceasefire. Uh, I want to ask about UNRWA, uh, oh. but, but just to follow up on, on your point now. I mean, are there any indications, has there been any assessment that uh, Hamas is about to lay down its arms, that it's re reaching the very end where it could say, cry uncle and say, that's it, we're done? You've seen the secretary uh, and others speak uh, pretty clearly that we believe um, some kind of uh, uh, deal uh, as it relates right. to uh, the release of hostages and uh, progress in other areas uh, continues to be possible, and it's something that we're continuing to work towards. Yeah, but just to remind you that last Monday, the intelligence chiefs, all of them said that you know Hamas is not about to lay down its arms, so this war can go on. Again, Zaid, this is something that we're going to continue to work towards. Okay, one last question yeah. on, on UNRWA. Uh, yesterday, uh, Senator Chris Van Hollen mm -hmm. uh, called uh, the claims against UNRWA uh, as flat out lies, unquote. Do you, are you in touch, first of all, with the, with the senator? Uh, you looked at what, you know, what he based his assessment on. Uh, you have, are you changing your position on uh, UNRWA and the investigation and so on, because it seems that all the Europeans, all your allies, Australia, Canada, all of them are saying there is no evidence that uh, UNRWA was involved in any way, shape, or form. And in, in, so, uh, Said, I will, I will, let the, I will, I will let the senator um, clarify or expand on any of his comments. I will just say that um, we found the um, allegations that were made mm -hmm. um, against certain UNRWA employees uh, mm -hmm. to be credible um, and to be legitimate, and that is why uh, we continue to be focused on this ongoing investigation. And as Secretary Blinken has said, it is important that these allegations are thoroughly investigated, that there's clear accountability and that necessary measures are put in place so it doesn't happen again. Uh, we believe that the United Nations recognizes this, which is why we welcome the fast launch of an investigation and an in independent review to look uh, at some of these issues, and we look forward to the result. I will also say, though, Said. Uh, we agree that UNRWA plays a critical role in providing life-saving assistance to Palestinians in Gaza across the region, including uh, essential food, essential medicine, shelter, and other vital humanitarian support. And lastly, on our uh, partners and allies in other countries, uh, these are sovereign decisions for those countries to make when it comes to uh, the support that they are in a place to uh, provision or not. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Uh, the, the head of UNRWA uh, today, uh, Philippe Lazzarini, said that he was denied entry into Gaza by Israel. Uh, does the United States have a stance on that, or, or has there been any discussion about that? Uh, I would uh, refer to uh, the uh, our is Israeli partners as well as the United Nations. I don't have anything to, to offer on that. But do you think it's, it's fine if they want to deny him? Uh, I don't have insight into what um, uh, Chairman Lazzarini uh, was going for, and so I don't want to... Um, uh, I, I, I don't want to misspeak, but I'm happy to, to, to look into more. But again, you've heard me say this before, just broadly, not as it relates to, to this circumstance. This is not uh, a border that the uh, United States uh, has access to. But in general, shouldn't the, you know, a senior official from UNRWA, which you say is a, is an important organization, should, should be allowed to visit Gaza? Certainly. I, the, but I, again, I don't know the specifics uh, surrounding this, so I just will refer to our Israeli partners on and this. Also, just to, sorry to clarify on your the, the position on UNRWA. Um, I think when the when the allegations first came out, the you know the secretary said they were the, these allegations are, are credible in terms of I think we're talking about twelve UNRWA staff <laughs> who took who may have taken part in October seventh, right? That's one kind of allegation. I think there's a broader allegation that. Hamas is a proxy for, uh, sorry, UNRWA is a proxy for Hamas. Does the U.S. have, regardless of... That is not, that's not, that's not an assessment that uh, we share. It's not an assessment that we, um, uh, that's, that's not an assessment that you've seen us um, 
speak to or, or, or share. What we're talking about when I talk about these yeah. uh, ongoing investigations is this specific circumstance around the subset of employees that you're re referring to. Right. Uh, Michelle. Yeah. We don't, uh, have you received any uh, plan from uh, Israel regarding entering uh, Rafah, especially that the Prime Minister has uh, confirmed during the weekend that they will be entering Rafah soon and they will be moving the people out uh, of the area? Uh, we have not seen um, any details to that plan, and we have been clear at the highest levels that uh, Israel cannot and should not proceed with a full-scale military operation in Rafa without a credible and implementable plan for ensuring the safety and support for more than the one million people sheltering there. Um, so no, we have not seen uh, uh, the details of that plan. Um, the government of Israel has said that they uh, will implement a humanitarian assistance plan. Um, they've said that publicly, uh, but uh, we have not seen anything uh, yet. So, sorry, what do you say? You have been clear that Israel cannot and should not start a Rafa operation. What, what, what does that mean, cannot? I mean, of course they can, right? What do you mean, Matt? Well, you say that they cannot and should not start an, an operation in Rafa without this plan. But I don't understand your use of the word can. Certainly, yes. I will just, to take a step back. If there's a plan course, or not, they can do it. it, it L right? Let me just say that, again, Israel, of course, is a sovereign country. I say cannot as a uh, turn of words um, to express our dire and immense concern about uh, I, I, any kind of impending, I get that, uh, but I mean, it's not an issue of can. If you, for, it's an issue of whether they should or not. Correct. Okay. I will also just note, though, Matt, though, even in the, if we're going to parse on the specific of the words, even Well, you in the were the can, one who used it. Not no, no, I mean, I just to say that even in the, if, if we're focusing on the can of it all, there continues to be a lot that uh, needs to be dealt with in the context of Rafa. One, you've heard us say this before, more than one million people are sheltering, sheltering there. Rafa as a region overall is a conduit for uh, entry of humanitarian aid. It's also a conduit for uh, departure of foreign nationals. Um, so uh, without a serious, credible plan that addresses all of this stuff, um, I think it would be very difficult uh, to conduct something like this. So perhaps they cannot even uh, do something like this without a credible plan. Can, can, I well, just, yeah. okay. can I just follow up on Matt? Uh, <laughs> because last week, the top Israeli commander, military commander, talked about something like three islands. He called them human islands and so on, for moving 1.4 million people. Now, could this look anything other than uh, like a concentration camp in your view? Is, so, that a, is that a map, that, is that a plan that you may have looked at? Side, let me just be very clear about this um, so there's no question. When we're talking about mm -hmm. uh, any kind of humanitarian plan as it comes to Rafa or um, plans that address um, how to ensure that the one million people sheltering there are not any, impacted by any uh, violence or, or military activity, uh, there is no part of that in which we claim uh, to mean that that would involve forcible uh, movement of uh, these people in Gaza, these people who might be sheltering uh, in, in Rafa. Uh, I would just say broadly that anything like that would, uh, one, need to be voluntary. Two, um, I've not seen the specifics of that plan, so I unfortunately can't comment on that. But both uh, in the context of our, our broader vision for the region, but both in terms of dealing with this uh, immediate um, uh, issue, uh, there should be no forcible movement or displacement of uh, the Palestinian people. Uh, go ahead. Uh, I'll, tell yeah. just, I'll stay also in Gaza. Yeah. Last evening, our colleague, our correspondent, mm -hmm. was arrested by ADF uh, in uh, Al Shifa complex uh, outskirts. He was wearing his vest, his helmet, he has his, his equipment with him. He was beaten, stripped, and got his equipment destroyed. This is, I mean, he, uh, the IDF clearly saw that he's a journalist with his equipment, and this didn't stop them, and just add him to a, a long list of journalists that being either killed, injured, or detained by the Israeli forces. Do you have any comments? We're aware of those reports, and we've asked the government of Israel for, for more information. Um, but in general, we have been very clear that 
uh, journalists play a vital role uh, and that uh, no journalist should be targeted in order to silence their voices in this conflict or any other. And um, the, the, the circumstances are as such in Gaza where we believe the uh, journalism and the voices of journalists is more important than ever. Uh, but again, as it relates to this specific situation, we've asked for more information, but I don't have any other specific comment on that. And about the Shifa Hospital, yeah. the uh, ongoing operation, because the, uh, the arresting happened right before this operation started, and that led us to believe that it is a way to, to black out what's going on in Al-Shifa complex. Uh, do you have, did you hear from your Israeli partners why they are targeting this hospital? So I'm not going to speak to specific military tactics or assessments or operations from up here. Let me just say two things. First, President Biden, Secretary Blinken, others um, have uh, made their points uh, quite clear that civilians at hospitals, uh, medical personnel, patients must be protected, and that hospitals must be enabled to be supported, to be run effectively, uh, and to treat patients and to care for people who need help from these hospitals. Uh, I will also just note, though, that there is plenty of open source information out there that indicate Hamas's use of many different kinds of civilian institutions, including hospitals, to store weapons, to function as command and control centers, to house its fighters. Uh, there also is information that Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad use some hospitals in the Gaza Strip, including Al-Shifa, and tunnels underneath to connect seal and support their military ho operations and potentially hold ho hostages. So uh, I'd refer you to the IDF to speak more to their specific operations. Uh, Alex, go ahead. Thank you, Benal. On this or another topic? I gotta, Move it to Russia. If I'm, well, I'm going to, I think other people got questions on this. So come I'll back. come back to you. In the uh, region? In the region, unless anything has, someone still has anything on Gaza specifically. I go ahead, Ryan. Follow up on what they're asking about, yeah. UNRWA. When, when you originally talked about the allegations against the 12 staff. You had said that UNRWA itself was the one that forwarded those allegations along. You said that you found them credible. But since then, UNRWA itself has said that its staff were tortured by Israel in order to get some of those confessions extracted. Does that change your view of the evidence that was presented by Israel? And if UNRWA was credible enough for you to believe the allegations the first time, is UNRWA credible enough when they make an allegation of torture against its staff. Uh, I've not seen that uh, that reporting, Ryan, but I, I will just note that we continue to find the allegations that were laid out a number of month, months ago to be credible. And we also welcome the swiftness at which uh, UNRWA uh, informed not just the United States, but others about this, but also the swiftness in which the United Nations uh, launched its own investigation mechanism and its own independent review. And we look forward to uh, seeing those results. And uh, to echo Secretary Blinken, we want these allegations thoroughly investigated so that there is clear accountability and measures put in place so this doesn't happen again. Uh, we want all this to happen because we believe very strongly that UNRWA plays a critical role in producing life-saving assistance in the region, not just in Gaza, but the broader Middle East as well. Uh, they are vital, vital um, players when it comes to food, medicine, shelter, and other humanitarian support. But your position, which is in opposition, as they said to so many allies around the world, has encouraged Congress to move forward with a ban. There's now a, an agreement between some Democrats and some Republicans to continue the ban think what throughout the rest of the year is that is that something that the state department would support tying the state department's hands even if the report comes back you, you've heard me talk about this before broadly when it comes to the supplemental bill that is uh, being negotiated in Congress. These are active and ongoing things that are happening, so I'm not going to go down a rabbit hole um, uh, too much. But broadly, we support the contours of this um, supplemental bill. We believe that it is vital for uh, what is required to support our Ukrainian partners, to support our Israeli partners. There's also funding in that supplemental bill for humanitarian aid, including a significant portion uh, for Gaza. So these conversations are going to continue uh, to happen, and I will let those uh, the, the bill more, take more concrete shape. Uh, anything else on Gaza on before Honduras, we move it? Anybody's got other What's that? I have one on Honduras, but if it, uh, yeah, well, I'll, I'll try to come back to you if I can. <laughs> DR, go ahead. Thank you, Ben. Yeah. One question on the Kurdistan region uh -huh. election. Uh, the Kurdistan region long delayed election, which was scheduled to be held in June 10. 
But today, the Kurdistan ruling party, KDP, announced that they will not participate in that election, and they said that the Iraqi top court is trying to impose an illegal and unconstitutional election in the Kurdistan region, which is not acceptable for them. And this may result in further delay in that election. Do you have any comment and reaction to that? And does the United States willing to engage with the parties in the region to bring the solution to that matter? We've seen the KDP Politburo uh, statement that they will boycott the upcoming Iraqi Kurdistan parliament elections. Uh, we're concerned by the KDP's announcement. Our consistent position has been uh, to support the conduct of and the full participation in free, fair, transparent, and credible elections. We also understand that many of the concerns raised by uh, Iraqi Kurds with respect to recent decisions made by the federal institutions, uh, but we don't think that boycotting these elections will serve uh, the interests of the IKR, the Kurdish people, or Iraq in general. And one more question. Yeah. The, the tensions between Kurdistan region and Baghdad is, is getting more intense and tense, especially after the Iraqi top court decisions against the Kurdistan region. So what's your reaction to that disputes? And how are you going to work with these two partners to, to bring a solution to that disputes? Uh, I will say we regularly engage with officials in Baghdad and Erbil about issues of shared interest, including Iraqi stability, uh, rule of law, and enduring protections of all of Iraq's communities. Uh, but I'm not going to get into the details of these court decisions. Fundamentally, though, the administration believes that stabilizing Iraq through the uh, protection of Iraqi minorities, preserving the electoral rights of those minorities, um, consistent with the Iraqi constitution, um, is going to lead to stability and security of the Iraqi Kurdistan region broadly. Thank you. Um, uh, go ahead. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Um, so Pakistan's uh, airstrikes uh, hit multiple TTP sites, like Taliban Pakistan sites inside Afghanistan that killed eight. Uh, and it was in response of a bombing, suicide bombing that killed seven soldiers in Pakistan. Do you have any comment? So we've seen uh, reports that Pakistan carried out airstrikes in Afghanistan in response to the attack in um, uh, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, uh, Pakistan, on Saturday at a, at a military post. Uh, we deeply regret the loss of life and injustices sustained during the attack in Pakistan and the loss of civilian lives during the strike in Afghanistan. We urge the Taliban to ensure uh, that terrorist attacks are not launched from Afghan soil, and we urge Pakistan to exercise restraint and ensure civilians are not harmed in their counterterrorism efforts. And we birth, b urge both sides to address any differences. Um, we remain committed to ensuring that Afghanistan never again becomes a safe haven for terrorists uh, who wish to harm the United States or our partners and allies. So is the United States is helping Pakistan in counterterrorism operations and intelligence sharing? We uh, are in regular communication with uh, Pakistani leaders to discuss Afghanistan in detail, including through our counterterrorism dialogue and other bilateral consultations. The U.S. ambassador to Pakistan, Donald Bloom, uh, met with the President Sardari, Prime Minister and Foreign Minister, and discussed bilateral uh, ties. Uh, can you just tell us what really discussed in those meetings? I think you just answered the, the question for me. You said they discussed bilateral ties. So, um, look, I, 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 I'm sure our, our, our embassy in is Islamabad will have, have more to share on this, but uh, Ambassador Bloom on March 15th did meet with um, Prime Minister Sharif to discuss a broad range of bilateral issues, as you said, partnering with the government of Pakistan on regional security, the United States' support for continued economic reforms with and through the International Monetary Fund, trade and investment, education, climate climate change, and other private sector-led economic growth issues that we continue to engage with uh, uh, our Pakistani partners on. Um, and they discuss a number of range of other issues as well. Can yeah, just, uh, on this yeah sure. Uh, when you say call on Pakistan to exercise restraint, could you elaborate? Does that mean that they shouldn't have carried out the airstrikes, they shouldn't carry out further airstrikes? Uh, are you speaking to the, the previous question, yeah, right? No, no, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, uh, I, Sean, I, any uh, loss of civilian life is um, uh, troubling and heartbreaking to us, and so we want to make sure that uh, when some of these uh, operations are being conducted, that every step possible is being taken, that uh, it's the perpetrators uh, that are uh, being held to account, and that um, it's not civilians who are uh, being impacted. Do you mind if I switch to a different topic? For not at all. Reasons? Go ahead. Uh, Niger. Uh, yeah. There has been a lot of uncertainty about that, the Junta's remarks appearing to uh, to 
to sever uh, military cooperation with the U.S. Do you, do you have any update where things stand? Uh, does the United States think that that's where Niger is going? So to take a step back, Sean, um, a senior U.S. delegation traveled to Niger last week to discuss uh, a number of issues uh, with um, uh, the CNSP. Uh, the U.S. is aware of the March 16th statement by the CNSP announcing the end of the status of force agreements between Niger and the United States. Uh, this statement followed uh, from uh, frank conversations from this American delegation on uh, the CNSP's trajectory. Uh, and we are in touch with uh, the transition authorities to seek clarification of their comments and to discuss uh, additional next steps. Uh, to seek clarification. I mean, is it the sense of the United States that the military cooperation is, is, is a good thing, that, that the United States wants to continue that and with Niger? I would say broadly that our security partnership with West African partners are mutually beneficial and are intended to achieve uh, what we believe to be shared goals of uh, detecting, deterring, and reducing terrorist violence and creating an environment conducive to economic and social development. And when you say seeking clarification, is there something that's been happening since Friday? Has there, obviously the delegations left, but has there been some sort of contact? How is the United States trying to seek that clarification? We continue to engage through um, our embassy. We continue to have our ambassador and our embassy team there, uh, and we're continuing to discuss with them. Um, I, I will just note that uh, the, the delegation meeting uh, it, it included an exchange of views and a number of ideas. Uh, Niger's path uh, to civilian democratic rule, our shared fight against terrorism, including uh, the role of U.S. security support, the importance of Niger conducting its external partnerships in a manner consistent with uh, international law. Uh, uh, those were a number of things that were discussed. Um, Nick, you've had your patiently hand up. I'll come to you, Alex, I promise. A uh, different topic. There are some rumblings on the Hill and elsewhere about uh, Chilean criminals using the visa wa waiver program to come to the United States, pardon me, <clears throat> and commit organized crime. Uh, some members on the Hill are threatening to block funding for the visa waiver program. Are you familiar with this issue and do you have any comments on it? So um, I don't have any specific comment on this specific uh, issue, Nick, but let me just say broadly in the context of visas in any circumstance as it relates to any country around the world, whether they are party to the visa waiver program or not, um, a visa allows a foreign national to travel to a U.S. port of entry and request permission to enter the United States. Uh, but the visa does not guarantee entry into the United States. U.S. Customs and Border uh, Protection officials at ports of entry have broad statutory authority to conduct inspections and permit or deny admission to the United States in accordance with uh, U.S. immigration law. Uh, we take the, I would say the administration broadly, um, takes the safety and security of our ports of entries quite seriously. I'm sure my colleagues at DHS would be happy to talk to you about some of this more. Um, Alex, go ahead. Thank you, Vedat. I have my question, but before that, let me go back to Russia briefly. Uh, curious where you're standing on growing <coughs> calls to the administration to refrain from recognizing Putin as a duly elected president? You were, were late, Alex. We talked about this at the top. We talked about this at the top. So you can read the transcript. So why don't we go to your I'll, next I'll question. I'll go back. Okay. Anything else? Uh, today marks five months since the um, uh, detention of IFRL reporter Asu Komashova in Russia. Um, I know there was a meeting last week in this building uh, as a secretary met with her husband. Um, wh what is your understanding of why she's in jail? Look, Alex, um, we believe her uh, detention to be uh, just a, another in a long line of the Russian Federation's actions of arbitrarily uh, detaining journalists uh, who are just uh, doing their jobs. Um, I, I will let them speak to any kind of sham explanation that uh, they are providing. Uh, but this is something that we're going to continue to remain deeply engaged on. Um, as you know, uh, she's not an uh, American citizen, so um, our, 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 our options here are, are, are somewhat limited. You meant she's, she is an American citizen. Sorry, she's a dual citizen. She's a, she is a dual citizen, and therefore our ability to engage through appropriate consular channels um, are, are, are limited because this is something that the Russian Federation often does uh, when it is detaining uh, dual nationals. Just to be honest, Clay, is that a reason to why the administration hasn't recognized her at the arrest as a detention as 
wrongfully yet? Uh, Alex, there's a number of uh, factors that go into these kinds of assessments, and I'm not going to speak to that deliberative process in specificity. What we don't hear from you is, is, is urgency. You know, five months in, the Russian authorities have never allowed her to, to talk to her to daughter, to her husband. Why, why is it taking this long? Uh, Alex, this is something that we're continuing to work around the clock. Uh, but again, I will remind you, we just spoke about this. Uh, when someone is detained as a dual national in the Russian Federation, uh, the Russian Federation has a long track record of not um, giving uh, respectful consular access consistent with the consular con convention as it pertains to the other country. Uh, there is a clear track record of this, um, and so it should be uh, no surprise that they are conducting them themselves in this way. But we are continuing to uh, be deeply engaged on this and, and work it around the clock. Thank you. On, on South Caucasus, if I may, yeah. I, I'm just curious if you have anything for me on Special Advisor uh, Bono's trip to the region. He has been there for a couple of days now and meetings in Baku. What is he hoping to achieve this time? Uh, I don't have any uh, updates on his trip, but I'm happy to, to check with the team and, and get uh, back to you. Okay. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to work with him, Alex. Okay, I got, sure. got to do it. Go ahead in the back. Oh, thank you. Um, yesterday, DP ROK launched a missile again. So do you have any uh, reaction for yesterday's event? Uh, we uh, strongly condemn, again, the March 18th ballistic missile launch. Um, these launches, like all other ballistic missile launches in recent years, are in violation of multiple UN Security Council resolutions. They pose a threat to regional and international peace and security, and we continue to consult closely with the Republic of Korea, Japan, and other allies and partners about the best way to engage the DPRK, deter aggression, and coordinate international responses to the DPRK's violation of multiple um, UN Security Council resolutions. Brian, go ahead. Dora, so earlier, earlier this month, former president, as you know, was convicted of uh, drug trafficking, but one of his major achievements aside from drug trafficking when he was in office was the creation of these kind of libertarian free market zones known as ZEDs that have been really popular with crypto investors. So just, I think, last week, President Castro withdrew from the World Bank's settlement court in order to uh, kind of fend off this $11 billion uh, attack by these crypto investors on, on Honduras. $11 billion would be about a third of Honduras's entire budget. Now, you've been pressured by some senators to kind of support these libertarian zones that are used by the crypto utopians, and some senators have asked you to support Honduran sovereignty and democracy instead. Is the state where does the State Department come down on this on this fight uh, going on between American investors and the Honduran government? You know, Ryan, I'm going to have to check in with the team okay. on that and get back to you, unfortunately. Uh, Michelle, go ahead. Yeah, uh, uh, I have two questions. Yeah. Uh, the down to, uh, one on uh, Assistant Secretary uh, Leif. Uh, she's been visiting the Middle East since last week. Uh, what is she trying to achieve? What is she doing there? So, um, as you know, uh, Assistant Secretary Leaf is a um, um, senior official of this department who's been um, engaged uh, around the clock on the many issues currently facing uh, the Middle East. Um, I'm happy to uh, check with the NEA Bureau if there's uh, specific readouts um, that we can share as it relates to some of our engagements. And on Niger, uh, yeah. is the U.S. delegation back to Washington? And what's going on with the Niger? Is the U.S. planning to leave the country? Uh, soon? Um, so they are back. Um, I think Sean asked uh, this question not too long ago, but um, I will just note that we are uh, aware of the March 16th statement from the CNSP. This statement followed uh, from conversations with this American delegation that they visited, where we had some uh, frank uh, conversations about the CNSP's trajectory, and we are continuing to be in touch with transition authorities to seek clarification and discuss next steps. Simon. Uh, Any plans to leave uh, very soon? This is uh, one of the things that we continue our, to be discussing with them and discussing next steps. I will just say, as I said to Sean, we believe our security partnerships in West Africa are mutually beneficial and they uh, achieve, are intended to achieve, I should say, what we think to be shared goals of detecting, deterring, and reducing terrorist violence. Uh, Martin Squeeze yeah. went in on Cuba. Uh, the Cuban Foreign Ministry said it summoned um, uh, U.S. top diplomat Benjamin Ziff um, after protests on Sunday um, and accused the U.S. of interfering in Cuba's internal affairs. Do you have any response to that? Well, let me just be quite 
quite unambiguous about this, Simon. The United States is not behind uh, these protests in Cuba, and uh, the ac accusation of that is um, uh, absurd. Uh, I will note, though, since you asked, we are closely following these reports. Uh, protests across several um, cities in Cuba yesterday called for electricity, food, and fundamental freedoms. I think what we are seeing is a reflection of the dire situation on the island. Uh, we urge the Cuban government to refrain from violence and unjust detentions and are calling on the authorities to respect uh, the Cuban citizens' right to peaceful assembly. Um, has the, have, you, have you responded to that summon? Uh, did the, did uh, Ziff go to, to meet them? I, I'm not aware. I, I'm not aware. I would have to check uh, specifically. Uh, Jaleel. Thank you very much, Mr. Patel, and happy Ramadan <laughs> to you. Uh, just two questions. Uh, when you were commenting about the strikes between Pakistan and Afghanistan, uh, I, I, I didn't feel like uh, uh, you sounded like Pakistan was an ally. It seemed like you were uh, treating both the countries in a very balanced manner, uh, telling Pakistan to restrain. So do you not believe that the Afghanistan land is being used by the TTP terrorist against Pakistan? Does well, the, for, let me just say first, next time um, you have feedback, you can find me on Yelp uh, if you'd like. Um, but, but look, broadly, um, we believe that it is, uh, it is important that, that steps be taken to minimize casualties. Um, we're aware of these reports that were carried out, and we deeply regret the loss of life and the injury sustained. Both the seven um, Pakistani soldiers who um, perished uh, in at the onset of the first uh, suicide bomb, as well as the civilians who were impacted and lost their life uh, by this counterstrike. Uh, Again, though, you know, Pakistan is an important and key partner and one that we are in regular communication with when it comes to talking to our counterterrorism dialogue and other shared security priorities. Uh, just, go one more, back. just one more. Thank ahead. you. Thank you very much. Really, then I'll come to you, Leon. Sorry. Uh, I had a uh, you know, uh, few weeks ago uh, uh, in uh, Adiala jail where Imran Khan is kept, two inmates in jail uh, were killed. Has Ambassador Bloom shared any concerns about uh, Imran Khan's uh, assassination or any security concerns with the State Department or no? Uh, I don't have any uh, specifics to offer on that, uh, as, including as it relates to Ambassador Bloom's meeting with Prime Minister Sharif. I don't have any other specifics to offer beyond what I laid out. Leah, go ahead. Thank you. Current and then we'll wrap after you. Sure. Currently, the third summit for democracy is taking place in South Korea. Compared to the past two years, there's been less media coverage surrounding it. And there's been criticism of the U.S.'s MIT list, as well as its message of democracy to the world, particularly from the global south. Do you think the Biden administration's approach to promoting democracy around the world is working? Well, I will just uh, note, Leah, that the, we are putting an immense uh, emphasis on the Secretary's participation in the Summit of Democracy, um, so much so that he gave uh, some pretty important set of remarks. First, let me just say, you know, we are um, thankful to our uh, uh, our, our hosts, uh, the Republic of Korea, for uh, hosting uh, the secretary at the beginning uh, of the summit and continuing to have um, some great programming throughout the week. We know that this is a shared priority, not just between the United States and the Republic of Korea, uh, but also other countries who participated. Uh, but the secretary, as, as part of this, outlined uh, the U.S. strategy to promote information integrity and resilience. Uh, we believe informa information integrity is critically important to address shared global challenges, including health security, the climate crisis, revitalizing our alliances. Uh, and we have a positive and holistic vision for a resilient information uh, environment. And let me just say, this is something that has been a priority for this secretary, uh, but it has also some, been something that our bureau, the Bureau of Global Public Affairs, as well as um, Under Secretary for Public Affairs and Public Diplomacy, Liz Allen, and her team have been deeply engaged on since the onset of this um, administration. All right, thanks everybody.